God is good. Last week, I began a new series in the first letter of Peter. So this is part two, uh, 1 Peter, part two. And I want to read you the first nine verses, and we'll look at some things that I believe God would have us here today. We've already read the first three last week, but I'm going to read them again. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. It's all about Jesus. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Not a little bit of peace now and again, but peace in abundance in the midst of all you're going through. Can I give you that this evening from the Father? Praise be to the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. If you're feeling you haven't got much tonight, God has given you an inheritance that nobody can take away. The inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all of this, you greatly rejoice. Amen? Amen. Though now for a little while, you may have to suffer griefs in all kinds of trials. Sorry about that bit. We'll talk about them a bit more. These have come. This is very important. And when we talk about that, this is very important. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. There's a purpose in it. Our trials are meant to bring glory to God. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled. This is interesting too. Filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I wonder how many of us, can. I wonder if I can say that tonight, that I am filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy because that's part of the current heritage of those who love Jesus. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I'm going to recap just a tiny bit, not very much. If you were, if you were not here last Sunday morning, then I'm sure, was it recorded, Kelf? Even though you were on yes. your holidays at Soul Survivor? Yes. Lovely. So you can catch up with some of the foundations of this Letter. We know he was one of Jesus' disciples. He was an apostle, Peter. And um, his first meeting with Jesus was amazing. Jesus had just come out of the wilderness where he had been tempted. And he didn't say, Peter, I think God could do something with you. We need to get you on a discipling course. He said, come right now, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. He saw right into the plan of God for Peter's life. And I just want to, I talked about it last week, but can I remind you tonight, God has a plan for your life. Um, Mike Timmins led this morning, and when he was leading, he, he said to the folk, I want to challenge you to read your Bible every day this week. That's a good challenge, isn't it? And actually, um, why not read Psalm 139 every day this week? And just be reminded that you are loved, chosen, created, and even before the world began, God had all your days written in his book before one of them came to be. So please do not run yourself down. You are a child of God, chosen and specially loved by him. And he has, just as he had a plan for Peter, and we know Peter had his ups and downs, don't we? We know sometimes he did incredibly well. Uh, particularly when he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's when he really got it right. Before then, he made lots of mistakes. He's just like you and me. And yet God spoke into his life on their very first meeting. 
that he was called and that he was chosen. And the very first, I will just mention again, the very first thing Jesus said when he came out the wilderness to the folk was, the Bible tells us that he preached repentance. If you don't know Jesus tonight as your Lord and your Savior, please do not leave this building without speaking to someone. Or if you don't want to speak to someone, just pray the prayer yourself, Lord Jesus. I understand that you died for me on the cross, that my sins can be forgiven. Would you come? Would you forgive me? And would you live in my life? I need you as my saviour. Will you do that before you go? Because it's the most important decision you will ever make. Knowing that God loves you is great because he does. He is love. But it's not enough to know. You have to invite him in. There'll be people going to hell wishing that they'd invited Jesus in because they'd known for a long time that Jesus loved them, but they didn't respond to his love. So Jesus began to repeat, uh, to preach repentance and um, Peter and his brother got up and they followed him. And Peter became a leader of the early church. He's an apostle. We believe from tradition, not from scripture, that he was martyred in Rome, crucified upside down. We believe this letter, most of the New Testament are letters, not like Facebook today where, we, where you can tell me what you had for breakfast, dinner and tea, but really, really, really important letters, words from heaven, from God himself, and they were carried by messengers from one place to the other and read to the churches in the area we now know as Turkey. And the theme is hope. You see, just like today in many parts of the world, and to some degrees, I guess it's coming here, Christians were going through really tough times and it involved a lot of persecution. We have tough times too, don't we? We're going to talk about that. But many of them then were alienated and persecuted. When things got really tough, there were seasons when leaders were particularly vile to Christians and they threw them in the Colosseum and they were thrown to lions and killed. It was tough being a Christian in those days. So Peter wrote this letter to give them hope. Let me read to you again a little bit of verse 3 to 8. Praise be to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade, kept in heaven for you who are shielded by God's power. Did you know that? Whatever happens to you, you are shielded by God's power. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. This has come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. So he tells the believers to remember when they're suffering a number of things. He tells them to remember you are born again. He tells them to remember because Jesus was raised from the dead, so will you be. And he tells them to remember you've an inheritance waiting for you in heaven, so rejoice. You have to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, don't you? Particularly when things are tough and it could be something dead simple that's really getting you down. You can't pay your bill and it's all you can think about. Where the next penny's coming from. Or somebody's ill and it's all you can think about. Or you've got a conflict with someone, what work may be. And it's all you can think about. You can't sleep. And God wants us to remember these things. Peter said, remember that you're born again, that you've got an inheritance in heaven. The reality of the Christian life it is that it can get really hard. Amen? Thank goodness here we don't preach the prosperity gospel that says, when you go out from here tonight, you'll never have another problem if you come to the front. It's just not true. You may have to suffer from time to time all kinds of trials. And so there are times, you and me, we weep 
and we rejoice both together. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been to a funeral when you've put your hands in the air and told Jesus you love him and tears have been streaming down your face because you miss the one you love? Of course there has. Peter says, remember whatever you're suffering, that you're born again, that you've got an inheritance, that you're going to see Jesus one day. We often say, in fact, I think we said it the other day when we were taught, I think you said it to me, Mary, how on earth do people manage when they suffer if they don't know Jesus? We haven't worked it out, have we? How on earth people manage when they don't know Jesus? Because Jesus gives us joy in the trial. Now, let me say a little bit more about joy. We've talked about joy before. Peter tells them, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Some some versions call it joy unspeakable and full of glory. Let me remind you, the world didn't give you that joy and therefore the world cannot take it away. Do you agree with me tonight? The world didn't give it you. It's not about circumstances. You know, last year, some of last year was tough for me because I, as you know, some medical problems. I try and I try and get to heaven once a year, but um, (laughs) heaven keeps sending me back. I might give it up next year and just stay as long as he wants me. But but in the latter part of the year, I had a season of real blessing. You sent me on a holiday. Bless you. I love you for it. You know, sometimes we get used to each other, don't we? This morning I was introduced as um, the one and only... I thought, well, I'll go back home tonight and I'll just be sure. But that's absolutely fine. But, but here, actually here, we're really good at appreciating one another, aren't we? And remembering that we're all really precious. Let's not get so used to each other that we stop appreciating one another. It's a good thing to appreciate. Sue and Glor, hang around them for a bit. They make you feel really great. Because they, they really do. They make you feel good. <laughs> it's truly not a joke. When I talk to Gloria and Sue, they make me feel good because they have nice things to say. And we need, we need to be like that, folks. We really do. Because we're very good sometimes at criticising one another, and that's not godly. Um, I'm talking about joy. So I went on this holiday, and then I got back. And then I got back and opened my front door, and my brother had built me a new bathroom, hadn't he? And it, it's, it's gorgeous. I, have, I don't know if you have a good brother. I have a better one. <laughs> Mine is the best. Honestly, he's just amazing. I love him so much. And I felt so... I, I burst into tears and I felt so happy. And I think it was mixed with joy because, you know, we're brothers and sisters and, and my brother's a Christian too. So it was mixed with joy. But I was happy, so happy. I kept walking into the bathroom and going... I can't believe it. You should have seen it before. It was dreadful. But, you know, joy is more than that. Because joy is not about circumstances. And we, as God's children, particularly in these last days, need to get our heads around this so that we can have joy when we're going through trouble. Because it's part of our current inheritance. We can have that bit now. It's from, the, it's from the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to pray later that God will just fill us again with his Holy Spirit so we can have a, an inexpressible, overflowing measure of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from good things happening. It comes from God And it doesn't depend on circumstance. It depends on the fact that we know God is sovereign. We've sung it tonight that he reigns. And we have to believe it. It's no good us just believing it on a Sunday. We have to believe it when things are difficult. That he 
reigns, that he is in control, that God is sovereign. Now, we know this verse inside out. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We know that verse, don't we? We need to believe it. And if if you don't currently believe it, just say it all day long until the devil gives up and he says, okay, you believe it. We have to make these things a habit. It's a habit. You know, moaning is a habit. If you're an old grump, it's a habit, isn't it? You've been practicing it for years. If you moan, and you've been moaning about this thing, we all know that you don't like it. You don't need to tell us again. Stop moaning. And practice a different habit. Practice coming into church and saying, oh, isn't it good to be in God's house? He's going to meet with me tonight, and I love him so much. You're looking good. And compliment somebody here and get into a new habit. These things, a lot of the stuff we do in church and in our lives that either bring us down or lift us up are things we've made a habit of. And we need some good Christian habits. We need to have the habit of dwelling on the goodness of God. Charles Swindle said, a positive attitude, joy is a positive attitude we choose to express. It's a matter of attitude that stems from your confidence in God. We can have joy because we've got confidence in our God. It's not positive thinking, folks. It's not mindfulness or any of these new philosophies that suggest we just retrain our minds. This is solid standing on the rock. This is my God reigns, and so I will trust him, and I will let his joy fill me even when it's difficult. You don't need modern philosophy. You need Jesus to give you his joy. There you go. We've said it before, and that's what we believe in this church. Oh, praise the Lord. (laughs) Nehemiah reminds us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Well, I don't know about, well, actually, you'd be daft if you didn't join me tonight saying, I want more joy, Lord. Give me more joy, Lord. Can I just mention that obedience matters? The Bible tells us that joy is a deep and abiding inner rejoicing which was promised to those who abide in Christ and obey him. You can't live like you want and expect to have everything God has for you. I'll show you, I'll give you one verse. John 15, if you obey my commands, Jesus said, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So we've got to do what Jesus tells us to do. If you're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing, why don't you stop it and have Jesus' joy instead and be obedient? Stop being a rebel. Come on. Let's walk with Jesus together. C.S. Lewis said, To trust him means, of course, trying to do all that he says. There would be no sense in saying you trusted a person if you would not take their advice. Thus, if you have really handed yourself over to him, it must follow that you're trying to obey him. But trying in a new way, a less worried way. Let's not get anxious about it. Because there will be people, won't there? Oh, I'm trying so hard to obey him. It's getting me down. I'm so anxious about it. I have no anxiety about anything. Pray about it. Rejoice about it, the Bible says. And we will have peace, peace that's abundant. So Peter reminds us that we will go through trials. And sometimes it seems that they come thick and fast, don't they? And we say, it's not fair. Well, who ever told us life was fair? Life isn't fair. That's how it is. And sometimes we say it's one thing after the other. Have you ever said that? I've heard some of you say that. And Luke says to us, it's one blessing after another. We've got to learn to rejoice. And we've got to learn to accept that trials are part of this life. One day this life will be over and we'll have no more trials. 
That's the reason I keep trying to get to heaven, I think. That was a joke. (laughs) I'll go when he's ready for me, but I'm not afraid of going either. Peter reminds us God is in control. Do you believe God is in control? God is in control of all the things that are getting you down right now. My sister-in-law's mum's just had a heart attack. She's in hospital in Swansea. They've just come back. God is in control. Alan and Mary have had a bodged up roof repair that's cost them a lot of money. God is in control. We have to believe that nothing is out of his control and he can get glorified out of working all things together for our good. We don't know how he's going to do it, but we believe that he will. He tells us that he tells us why trials have come. Now, this is very, very important. I understand that there are times we have to do spiritual warfare and we always have to pray. Of course, that's all right and proper. But let me just say this. When you say, oh, the devil's been after me this week, in a way, you're kind of getting it wrong because Peter tells us why God permits trials. Why does he just not stop them so we can have a really cushy life? That'd be nice, wouldn't it? I'll tell you, there's a reason why God permits trials. It says so that our faith which is more valuable than gold, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour. God permits trials. God permits them. So if the devil wants to have a go, he has to go through God first. And if God permits them, then God wants to use it for his glory. And he wants to knock some rough edges off us. If if I hadn't had trials, you wouldn't like me very much. You may not like me now, but you would like me even less. Because when I have a trial, I'm hoping anyway, as I submit to him, that he's knocking some rough edges off me and he's making me more like Jesus. We have to understand what is precious to God. Do you honestly think when we meet him, he's going to be really kind of overwhelmed with the fact that we could play the guitar or we got a degree or we were good at painting or God made the universe he doesn't need our giftings praise God he does use us and hallelujah we should serve him but what is most precious to him is our faith and our trust in God this book tells us that's what's most precious to God Peter reminds us that faith is proved genuine by going through the fire and we are refined. So he allows trials, God himself allows our trials to remove impurities and to cause us to trust him more. Do you believe that tonight? Because that's what the Bible says. Yeah, you might have allowed the devil to come and do something in your life but God allows it for his purposes. When you don't understand what's going on, when it hurts really bad, when you think you can't take any more, when it seems so unfair, and I know many of you are going through some really tough times at the moment, and it's, a, it's hard. We all know what tough times are like. All he wants you to do is trust him. And when we trust him, he promises to work it out for our good so that he gets glory. How he's going to do that, only God knows because God is, God is good all the time. These have come, your trials have come to prove the genuineness of your faith. That's what Peter says to these Christians which is of greater worth than gold. Your faith, your trust is more important than your gifting. It's even more important than your serving. It's even more important than your love. God wants you to trust him. Isn't that amazing? And so we cry, God, this hurts 
And I don't know why it's happening, but even if you slay me, I will trust you. I've said this brief story before, but it's the best one I can, I can come up with. Remember when I was uh, a teenager and I was in the sea in probably Barry Island, I would guess. That's where we mostly went for um, Sunday school trips with the Welsh church we, we were involved with. And I said to one of my little nieces or nephews, aren't you scared? You're really out in the deep. Your feet can't touch the bottom. And they looked at me totally ridiculous as if I was stupid because we do say some stupid things to children, don't we? And uh, they said... No, I'm with my daddy. Folks, when you're out in the deep waters, you're with your daddy. And he loves you and he's not going to fail you. He's going to see you through. I want to finish by reading Isaiah 43, a few verses from there, because I believe they are for people here tonight. And I want you to go and read them again at home. And I want you to stand on them. And I want you to receive the joy that comes from walking with the Holy Spirit. And now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you, do not be afraid. It's an instruction. Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. See, that's what Peter told them to remember. You're born again. I have called you by name. You are mine you are God's. And he's reigning, isn't he? There is no, he doesn't have a rival, we sang. Do we believe that tonight? I've called you by name, you are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown because you're with your daddy. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. He would say this tonight to us folks, because he's more interested in our faith than anything else in our lives. Let's just pray together. God, we thank you that you are reigning, ruling, and even as we declare it, Lord, there's a joy that wells up inside of us to know that you are in control. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here tonight, many of them going through all kinds of trials. Lord, trials that you have permitted so that you can work things together in their lives for good and their faith can just grow and you can show, they can show you, Lord, that they trust you and you can knock the rough edges off their lives, Lord, so they can be more like Jesus. We say, Lord, make us more like Jesus through our trials, would you? Help us to trust you and not to be afraid. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would fill us afresh with the Holy Spirit, and that inside of each one of us tonight, there would be a well of joy, abounding forth in us, Lord, welling up inside of us, so that whatever we have to go through, we can go through with our daddy, and he can be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.